Mm-hmm. Okay. Welcome. Welcome to the reading of I Married a Mystic. I am uh, very much looking forward to this time together. And whether you're new to this book or you've read it through before, uh, it's an epic journey of awakening. And it just feels like the perfect timing to go through it right now together. It's a very profound time in general in our lives uh, with so much happening in the world and everyone really being encouraged to, to stay home and go inward. So it feels like a real gift to have this focus to come together and go through this entire journey and really see how the Spirit wants to use our time together throughout this coming at least month because it's 27 chapters. <laughs> so, so again, welcome. And we'll begin with chapter one, meeting a mystic. Spring, summer, fall, winter, 2004. So there is a lot packed into this very first chapter. This is throughout spring and summer and fall and winter of 2004. And it starts with a quote from The Course of Miracles from a workbook lesson, 182. This world you seem to live in is not home to you. And somewhere in your mind, you know that this is true. A memory of home keeps haunting you, as if there were a place that called you to return, although you do not recognize the voice, nor what it is the voice reminds you of. Surrender. I fell to my knees and cried out for help. I'd been, un- I'd been knocked unconscious twice within 18 months, and both accidents had happened just as I'd had the thought, I don't want to be here. And so I knew that if I didn't give my life over completely at this point, I was going to kill myself, literally. What happened next changed my life completely. I had a direct experience of God's love that is almost impossible to convey. What I can say is that on my knees I found myself shaking and crying, feeling an indescribable love radiating throughout my entire being. It was unlike anything I'd experienced before and had nothing to do with anything of this world. It was so whole and pure, deep and breathtaking, that my life was changed forever. I knew that I was loved beyond anything I had ever understood. I knew that this love, this huge presence of majesty and grace, was behind everything, aware of everything, loving me always. In this recognition, my life was given over. Never again could I pretend to know my own best interests unless I was in direct contact with this awareness. I felt for the first time in my life that I could relax and trust that the Spirit was in charge. The journey begins. Seven months later, I was invited to dinner to meet David Hofmeister, an American mystic. I'd never met David and knew almost nothing about him. Recently, I'd watched him on a DVD where he was walking into a canyon talking about the present moment. 
He was a vibrant, blue-eyed man in his forties. He appeared very peaceful and happy, as if he was having a mystical experience. As I was getting ready for this dinner, I felt butterflies in my stomach, as if I were going on a date. How surprising! And then suddenly I remembered that whilst watching David on the DVD, I'd heard the spirit say, This is your life partner. What is happening? I wondered. I didn't know what to make of this, and I didn't dare tell anyone. I was so shocked at the enormity and unexpectedness of this message that I'd pushed it out of my awareness completely. At dinner that night were my parents, Jackie and Roger, and their friends, Mia and Lars, and David and I. Jackie and Mia had been A Course Miracle students for two years and had gone as far as they could with their current study group and they'd searched online for someone who was living the course. They were thrilled when they found David, and he accepted their invitation to come to New Zealand. The night was so much fun. Roger and Lars, Jackie's and Mia's husbands, took turn making light of the few course principles they'd picked up, making sure we were all well aware that they were the ones who'd provided the credit card for David's plane ticket and the meal, not God. <laughs> Jackie and Mia had their hands full, trying to redirect the conversation back to sincere spiritual questioning. I watched David as he had a wonderful time, his blue eyes sparkling with delight. It seemed that he had nothing to prove and his humble presence and graciousness were compelling. His joyful spirit could handle anything from any angle and use it as a means to connect. From motorbikes and tennis to private thoughts and husband and wife dynamics, it all became a swirling, joyous conversation. A surprising new direction. Two days after the dinner, Jackie and I drove to Mia's house for a weekend retreat with David. I went to my room to settle in, and on my oh, I went to my room to settle in and sat on my bed to meditate. David walked past my room, appearing so ordinary, in his shorts, sandals, and polo shirt. He felt like a big, soft presence of love. I found myself inviting him to join me. I'd love to, he replied, and together we sat and sank into a beautiful, peaceful meditation. The spirit poured through David as he spoke that night and throughout the weekend. As I was still recovering from two head injuries, I often had my eyes closed as I listened. At times I curled up on the floor on some cushions. It was a miracle that I could stay in the gatherings all day, since my energy levels were usually exhausted by early afternoon. But in this gentle, vibrant energy of the spirit, I felt nourished by every word that David spoke. This felt very deep for me. I realized that most of the exhaustion I usually felt was actually because I was tired of the world. I could only handle being aware of it for so long. But when listening to David, I felt that what was coming towards me was loving and supportive for my mind and soul. For the first time in 18 months, I had real hope that the head injury symptoms that seemed to dominate my life were temporary. I knew that the shift was directly connected to the purpose of awakening.
I'd been studying A Course in Miracles with Jackie and Mia for six months at this point. And when this retreat was over, I intended to take my newly found mind training tool and go back to my beloved alpine village of Wanaka. This place was my idea of heaven on earth, and I was going to live there happily ever after. Or so I thought. During a break, one of the participants asked me out of the blue if I was going to the peace house with David. I replied, no, I'm here for the retreat, and then I'll be going back down to the South Island. A little while later, someone else asked me the same question, and again I replied, no. A third person came up to me and asked if I would be going to America with David. I said, not that I'm aware of, but I'm open to that possibility. When the fourth person asked me, I said, I may be. When the fifth person asked me, I said, yes. <laughs> I told Jackie about the people coming up to me, and together we went to share the news with David. His response was, wonderful. He told us that Kathy, his secretary of five years, had recently left the ministry to get married, and the young couple who lived with him for some time had moved to Canada. The peace house was left with only David and the cats, Angel and Tripod. Since the cats didn't do a lot of secretarial work, David thought it would be wonderful to have me come and stay for three months as a volunteer. My body had felt cold for about five years, especially my fingers and toes. By the second day of the retreat, I found that my whole being was flooded with warmth. It felt like an inner furnace had been turned on. And I was a little embarrassed to find myself heading to the bathroom every couple of hours to splash myself with cold water. So I just feel to pause there for a moment. Just how profound it is, how, how everything's already written, how everything's already known in mind. Like seeing David on a DVD, not knowing who he was, and hearing this is you know, my life partner meaning this is a lifelong path, you know, and then having my own ideas of what was going to happen with my life, coming to a weekend retreat and then feeling ready to, to go back down to the South Island of New Zealand, and then people one after another coming up to me basically to, to tell me, no, there's something else, there's a new direction coming. And even the timing of that, that, yeah, that, that the peace house was empty and it was the perfect time for, for someone to come and be of support. So recently I had shared with my family that I wanted to experience a love that couldn't come to an end. Jackie, being a course student, quietly beamed in recognition of what I was beginning to realize. That I wanted a holy relationship. The love that I wanted was God's. One morning, while David was teaching, I thought I saw a wedding ring on his finger. I was a little surprised, but didn't say anything to anyone. During the session, a participant asked him if he would ever get married. He replied that he was very open to the Spirit's plan, however that may unfold. The next day, I noticed that David was no longer wearing the ring, and I asked Jackie why he would wear a wedding ring for just one day. She gave me a quizzical look and told me that he hadn't been wearing a ring at all. 
the spirit had already told me that David was going to be my life partner. I interpreted the ring I'd seen on his finger to be a vision telling me that we were to be married. But marrying someone who traveled around talking about God was certainly not the direction that I had planned for my life, and I found myself too taken aback by it all to say anything. For the next few days, every time David spoke about marriage, I could have sworn he was speaking directly to me, although I had my eyes closed most of the time, so I couldn't actually see who he was looking at. My whole being responded to this unmistakable presence of love. I recognized that it was coming from the same source that had radiated throughout my soul when I had fallen to my knees in surrender. Awareness of this presence was all that I wanted. I didn't know what any of it meant, so I simply basked in the warmth. The Peace House. The following six weeks were like a fast flowing river. I returned to Wanaka, packed up my belongings, and garaged my car at a friend's house. I flew to Cincinnati, where David picked me up at the airport. And we drove to the Peace House, a quaint green gingerbread house from the 1860s, set in a quiet inner city neighborhood. Inside, it was simple, clean, and welcoming. As we walked into the living room, appropriately called the sanctuary, it felt as if we had entered a chapel. David told me that I could choose any room as my own. There were two bedrooms downstairs, as we walked past the staircase leading up to two more bedrooms, one of which was David's, I heard the spirit say within my mind, take your bags up to David's room. I was shocked. My response to this guidance was, I'm not that kind of girl. <laughs> David, of course, didn't hear a word of this internal dialogue. I walked straight past the staircase and checked out the two rooms downstairs. And thus, my Goldilocks experience began. I tried the coziest room downstairs, but I just couldn't sleep. I was awake all night. I blamed it on the furnace, which was, after all, very noisy. The second night, I also couldn't sleep. I tried the bed in the other downstairs room for a couple of hours, but I couldn't settle in there either. The third night, I went to the couch in the sanctuary, assuming that I was so exhausted by this point that surely I would sleep, but I couldn't. By the fourth day, I was wrecked. Still recovering from head injuries, sleep was very important to me. Three nights without any sleep was a major problem. I told David I didn't know why I couldn't sleep and asked if he would turn off the furnace. David checked the weather and discovered that there was a blizzard on the way. Turning the furnace off was not an option because the pipes would freeze and after all, it was the middle of winter. He said that if I wanted to, I could share the huge king-sized mattress on the floor in his room. Usually I didn't sleep very well with someone else in the bed, so I thought the chances of me being able to sleep with David were very low. But that night, I curled up in his bed and slept soundly. It was as if I had landed in the most peaceful place in the world. My mind was able to rest, still and silent. There was no doubt that this was where I was meant to be.
So we'll just see if there are questions that you've typed in or yeah, then I'll have a look at those. And as we go through the reading, if there are questions that come to you about any themes or topics that you want to go into in more detail, uh, you can always also email me. Um, I can yeah, have that written in the, in the text chat too. But uh, kiwigirlmystic at gmail.com and just write in your questions in that way. But yeah, this first chapter just feels like it's a very fast-flowing river. Oh, and uh, yeah, there isn't a particular theme there that I feel to go into more deeply at this point. So thank you for joining.